So first of all, uh, this is not a hands-on session, but rather a, a demonstration of how to do certain things. So yesterday during my talk on uh, building smart connected products in WC IoT platform, I kind of uh, used a particular uh, example to, uh, to explain certain things uh, of different stages of uh, building a smart connected product. Okay. So this is more of a uh, detailed demo of uh, the same thing. So uh, I see like uh, there are some of you who haven't been there yesterday. So because of that, I'll be using uh, some slides from yesterday as well uh, to explain uh, uh, certain things. Uh, I don't know all the customers here, so uh, I would like to understand uh, who are family with WC2 platform, who are using WC2 products. Okay, so which means uh, there are a few gentlemen uh, that I have to address, but uh, I'll try to uh, cover some of the things uh, so that uh, uh, certain things about the product, starting the product, are also covered. Okay, uh, so first of all, let me just explain uh, what I'm going to do. Yes. So, uh, in order to explain how a smart connected product can be uh, done, yesterday I, I spoke of this uh, locker that is connected to WC IoT platform. Right? So that locker is over here. So you can actually take a look. Uh, feel free to come in front and take a look. And this locker actually consists of, it's quite messy, uh, but uh, the contents, I'll explain the contents so that uh, it'll, uh, it'll help us uh, to understand certain, certain things. So this locker, at the right on the top, it's having a, a sensor that's actually get pushed when the door closes. So that's the door sensor. Right? Then there's a, a lock. This is called a solenoid lock. Basically, uh, when you give power, it actually uh, pushes this particular part in. So uh, I actually don't, uh, if I forgot my 12-volt 12, 12 power supply because of that, the, uh, this guy will not be working. But uh, after that, uh, there's this uh, module called ESP8266. It's actually a Wi-Fi chip that can be programmed. So uh, if, you are, uh, know, if you are aware of uh, Arduino, uh, it, actually, it is actually compatible with Arduino code so that you can uh, uh, update, sorry, you can, you can put uh, C-based code inside this particular chipset so that it can, you can control how it is behaving. Then, <coughs> Uh, this particular keypad, right? so usually this is called a 3x4 matrix uh, keypad, uh, because there are three lines here and uh, four lines here. And uh, it is being driven, so it actually creates a matrix. So when you press something here, uh, to detect what, what was the key that was pressed, there's something called a keypad driver, so I'm using this particular module. And there's a relay module, so that uh, once we make a decision to open the lock, or do certain things, it will be convey, conveyed from this particular, uh, that's the brain, brain to the relay module so that you can do something with it. So that is how this uh, uh, lock gets connected. So it sends the, sends the uh, instructions to open the door or not. So you can even like convert, like connect that into a light or do uh, anything that you want to do with it. It's just a switch. And uh, there's a temperature sensor temperature and humidity sensor so that you can actually detect uh, the temperature and the humidity inside this locker. Okay. And this IR sensor that is placed somewhere here that can actually, so there are two uh, bulbs here. Uh, okay, it's wrong to call them bulbs, but uh, basically uh, it's emitting an IR. So if I place something here, okay, it'll actually, uh, so this IR sensor's distance is somewhere close to here. So if I place something here, it will actually detect that there's an object here. And the small green piece here is actually a metal detector. So if I put 
if this particular piece happens to be a metal, it will also indicate that it's a metal. Okay? So uh, these are the sensors and the actuators that we have today in this particular. Should I not be moving here? Oops. Really? No. Okay. We'll see. Ah. Thank you. So, um, and uh, we'll be sharing the slides later on. So, this is the schematic actually, if anybody really wants to build this. Okay. So, uh, now let me explain uh, certain things uh, in, in a slightly different way. Now, for me to build this particular connected product, uh, for me to build this particular connected product, I'm using WSO2 IoT server. Okay. Not sure what I'm doing. Uh, can I? Okay. So uh, I have the IoT server, which I have downloaded. So if you actually go to WSO2 uh, dot com slash download slash IoT, right? You can actually download this. Um, uh, if you click download here, you will be taken to the download of IoT Server One, sorry, three one zero. I'm using a rather updated version, which is available on the Git on our Git repository, which is called IoT Server three one zero update five. This has uh, some updates with regard to the analytics. So what I have what I have here is the particular product being downloaded. So I have it running, I'll just So once you download and extract, it will get extracted into uh, a folder like this. Okay. So if you go inside here, pretty much similar to any WC2 product, you would find this folder structure. Right? And to start any product, you have to go to the bin folder. Uh, bin folder. Sorry about that. So, uh, Inside the bin folder, sorry, uh, there are a couple of scripts, but uh, in our case, I'm going to use some of these uh, shell scripts. So I'm going to use the IoT server.sh and the broker.sh and the analytics.sh. So if I put this in a different way, the product has three profiles that are targeted to do three different things. Okay? So the IoT server SH is starting up a set of components that can deal with uh, like receiving messages from devices, uh, keeping certain metadata about the devices, like that. Then the broker.sh is actually starting up a MQTT broker through which we can communicate to the devices. Then the, that is actually a, like a pretty much a lighter version of WSO2's message broker. Then the analytics.sh is starting up an, an a lighter version of WSO2's stream processor. Not the latest version that you guys have been presented yesterday, but a, a, a slightly older version. Uh, we, have, we plan to update it to the later version uh, pretty soon. So what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to a, so I have all these, uh, if my screen is not clear, you guys have to tell me so that I can. Uh, so I'm on the same folder, right? So in these three windows, I'm going to start these three profiles. By default, when you download, all the ports have been correctly offsetted so that you don't have to do any configuration. You can just start up the three instances without any conflicts. Right? And uh, I also want to tell uh, uh, about a particular setup. 
Now, the particular module that I showed here, that I said, the particular uh, brain that I'm using, it's actually a Wi-Fi chip, like I've said before. So it is capable of connecting to a Wi-Fi network. Right? So uh, using my phone, I have created a hotspot. And its name is Devices One. Devices One. So my laptop is connected to that particular hotspot, right? And pretty soon, once I boot this particular device, it is going to get connected to that one as well. I'll show you how that is that was configured. Okay? So first of all, let me uh, just start these products. So like I've said before, to start the IoT server, IoT server SH. And then to start the broker, broker.sh. And to start the analytics, analytics.sh. This, uh, these products, uh, the IoT server SH is uh, going to start a, quite a heavy profile, so it's going to take uh, like uh, one and a half minutes to do that. We are in the process of making it much more leaner. So uh, while that is starting up, let me show you something else. So I'm going to start the analytics as well. So I don't have internet connectivity at this point. Because of that, I won't be able to show you uh, uh, certain things from internet. But uh, So this particular Git project, I'll share this later on, has all the source code that I will be using. Okay? So uh, let me just explain. So uh, uh, let me just explain the structure of this particular project. So this has three folders, agent, analytics, and web app. So other, other three files are IntelliJ IDEA project files that I have generated so that I can open up this, uh, in an IDEA. Okay. So if I, while the server is starting, if I show you the content, I believe I need to increase the font.
at least tell certain uh, important concepts. So like I've said before, I think I need to increase the font here as well. Can the guys at the back see? OK. So um, this has certain, uh, now uh, this particular section defines certain pin numbers that Anybody who has programmed with the ESP8266? Yeah, so I'll, I'll send this. Uh, so this has certain uh, pins. So there are associated pin numbers. So uh, see here, D, I actually can't see the screen from here. So it's, uh, uh, I believe this is D8, right? OK, D0. So uh, you, you can see those pins here. Just pass this around. Uh, D4, I believe, D5, yeah. So uh, basically, it tells. It tells that the, the switch is connected into D0. Uh, the LED, there's a LED uh, that, show that, that gives some input when you're entering the keys. LED is connected to a particular pin. And, uh, and this is the metal detector, MD. Metal detector is connected to a certain pin. The relay is connected to a certain pin. And uh, uh, the IR detector is connected to a certain pin. Okay. Then, uh, we are telling this that this is a three by four matrix keypad that we are using, right? And we also like tell them that uh, this is the structure of uh, this particular keypad. Okay. And this is the place where we are defining the Wi-Fi network, right? So it tells, uh, don't please don't connect to this one. Uh, it'll, uh, it can ruin certain things. Uh, so uh, devices one and the SSID, uh, sorry, the password. And then uh, this particular device is having certain parameters that will help the server side to identify this particular device. Okay? Uh, I'll explain about this thing later on. So I will omit that one. And uh, certain things about the server as well. So that section altogether I will uh, just uh, take on later on. Then uh, this is about how we read the temperature from the sensor, right? So it's called DHT11, that's why the name DHT here. And this is about how we read the IR sensor. So basically, uh, uh, if, if you put something in front of the sensor, it will emit number one. Uh, actually, the voltage uh, will be set so that uh, the value reading will be number one. Then, then this is where we read the metal detector. This is where read, we read the switch from the door. And I said that we'll be communicating through a broker, MQTT broker. So this is the part where this is the part where we are constructing the topic hierarchy for various things that we'll be using the broker for. For example, like uh, uh, to. Uh, to publish events, we'll be using this particular uh, path to uh, subscribe to certain operations, control operations that are coming from the server. We'll be using this particular path. And uh, to acknowledge certain operations, say, for example, when, the, when somebody uh, opens the lock, uh, to acknowledge that the door has been opened, we, we use this particular uh, path. And uh, as you see, that there are variables that will be replaced based on the runtime values. Then uh, I will not go into detail of this one. I, and then, uh, OK. So for, the, for this particular device to connect to the server, right, the device requires a token. It's actually an OAuth token. So on the server side, I, I, yesterday, I mentioned that the server side exposes its capabilities as REST services, protect, manage REST services. And uh, they are protected using OAuth tokens. Okay. So uh, this particular piece is actually connecting to the server. So the token endpoint is defined right at the top. From where this tells where to obtain the tokens. And then 
it is calling the token endpoint right with uh, the okay uh, this is the consumer key and the consumer secret for the oauth application that is on the server side right? and then certain parameters and it will be getting the oauth token for the device to connect into the server then the other method is connecting to the Wi-Fi network. Right? So you will see some of these uh, log statements uh, appearing on the device uh, pretty soon. And then this particular method constructs a message that will be sent into the server. Right? So this message constitutes of a string temperature and the value that we read before, then the humidity, the string humidity, and the value that we read before, whether it's a metal and the value that we read, the occupancy of the locker, the open close status of the locker, it will be a true false. So all these will be con constructed into a single string and will be pushed into the server. I'll, I'll show that part happening later on. Yeah, this, this particular method is all about uh, syn content concatenating a certain command that will be coming from the server. I will not go into details of this at this point. Okay. Yeah. So uh, this is actually the uh, the this is like the init or the main method of this particular device. So when this particular device is being given power, uh, whatever that you have that you read write inside this particular method method will be called. So all the all the met methods that we saw before, we are, are included here. So that, for example, uh, we'll have a line telling the device is starting, and it tries to connect to the Wi-Fi network. Then uh, uh, get the tokens, uh, construct the topic URLs, okay? and uh, set the set the pins to uh, to send or receive uh, signals. Yeah, and if if for some reason the server is disconnected, uh, this method will try to reconnect, establish the connection back again, which is pretty much a common scenario in IoT. Yeah, okay. So that's pretty much what we'll be passing into this particular guy. It's a significant set of uh, code. Okay, okay so uh, now with that, let me take you, okay, before that, any questions on this one so far? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. It's uh, so uh, IoT server has MP MQTT broker built in, right? and uh, the part of the topic hierarchy you can control. The other part is actually uh, defined, by the product. defined by the product. So the IoT uh, all WC2 products are supporting this multi concept of multi tenancy. Right? So by default, like in this case. Uh, we are we call it the super tenant, right? So super tenant's uh, tenant name is called carbon dot super. Okay? So that's why. Where did I have it? Yeah, that's why you have that here, right? But if you happen to have a separate tenant name, it will be here, so that a single server can actually serve devices belonging to multiple tenants, completely in isolation. And these topics are actually separately authorized. And authenticated, so uh, like uh, even though you you happen to know the topic hierarchy, you can't access it. Uh, what we have done is uh, uh, on top of the MQTT, we have written a separate OAuth token handler, so that whenever somebody tries to access a particular top topic, you need to give that OAuth token, uh, and then we check for the authorization. Exactly, yes. I just wanted to show the uh, uh, client agent first so that uh, certain things on the server side will be made obvious. And I'll come back here. To... Any other questions? Yes. Uh, okay, uh, 
there are two sides. So uh, the token that a particular individual device instance will be using, right? It's unique to the device, right? So uh, it depends on how you write the agent code that is running inside the uh, uh, inside the device. So yesterday, I I mentioned about this particular one. Um, So different ways that you see on dev provisioning devices. So if you, if you consider like almost all the IoT devices that you see on the market, right? Uh, oops. Uh, one is at the point of the device hardware being manufactured, you can burn the key or the certificate into the device. Right? So that's one approach. So that in that case, when the device tries to connect into a network, it, it sends those. The second approach is you burn these things at the point of writing the firmware, which is pretty much the approach that we are taking here. So you send part of it into the uh, at the point of burning the key, uh, the firmware. The third approach is using this particular module called TPM. So TPM is a separate, uh, it's called Trusted Platform Module. Uh, it's a separate business itself. So say for example, you, you have this, it's like, uh, uh, creating mutual authentication between uh, two, two, two servers. So this is a separate piece of hardware that you can purchase, so that on top of your device, you plug this in. And on the server side also, there's a separate module, so that the encryption and the decryption happens outside your uh, device and the server. So then the, the, the fourth approach that I've explained is user-initiated so that user does something. Say, for example, if you, if you install a, a Nest thermostat, right, there's a part that the human has to perform. And also, it is also connected into something that is burned into probably hardware or firmware. I don't know which, because I have no idea of the device. OK, so uh, what we are going to do is uh, related to this one and this one. So, uh, Later on, I, I think I'm doing something. Uh, I think there's a, a small loose connection here. Yeah. So, uh, okay. Let me show you the. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, does the CPM also break the CPM and the wiki password and all that? Yeah. Uh, does the CPM help us in hiding those things? Uh, yes. So. Does the device get hijacked to find out what the password is? Exactly. But. Uh, when a device gets hijacked, right, uh, uh, there are different things that can happen. So first of all, uh, one scenario could be you, you know that the device got hijacked. Right? So let's say that that particular device was associated with a vehicle. So uh, as part of any IoT platform, you have that metadata repository telling this particular vehicle had this particular device ID. So on the server-side platform, you can actually block event stream coming from that particular device, or you can block that certificate or the token. That's one approach. Second thing is, you don't know that the device is hijacked. Right? It will take some time for you to figure out. So your system needs to have some application level intruder detection mechanisms to, to understand certain patterns. Uh, a regular device will be doing these, these type of things, but a hijacked device 
will do this type of thing. It's like this credit card detection, fraud detection patterns where you, like, uh, like if there are a series of small set of transactions and a big transaction that's considered a, a typical uh, credit card theft. Right? So likewise, you need to have some pattern det detection mechanism built into your platform. So based on your business scenario, that is considered uh, an anomaly. Right? It does. So in, in that case, now, now let's say like you're supposed to have that particular device and I steal it, right? Now, if I'm, if I'm not using that for an abnormal scenario, it will be very difficult for you to detect that, right? So uh, it, it, the, the problem with the IoT is like, so yesterday I kind of uh, touched this, uh, you were there, uh, but let me just uh, use this the benefit of others. So unlike a typical server-side software development uh, deployments that you see, the problem with the IoT is there's a larger part of your system that is distributed and remote. So that there's very little that you can do to control this. So unless you have enough measures at different layers to identify frauds, anomalies, failures, uh, it's, or, or distribute firmware and ensure those firmwares and security updates have uh, been rolled out successfully. Uh, at the server side, it's very difficult to like, manage that in an efficient way. That's, that's where the IoT platforms come in and play a significant role. Uh, I, thought, I think I answered. Yes, sure, yeah. I haven't worked with TPMs a lot, so. OK, so uh, now what I'm going to show you is I, I walk you through the, 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 the device code. Uh, now I'm going to show you the three servers that I have started. So, so this is the first server, IoT server, uh, that I have started. It is booting up on 9443. Okay. Then we will also be having the analytics server running on 9445, port 9445, we will not be having a UI. At this point, we don't have a UI for the broker. Okay? So the broker will be running on 9446, that is for the HTTPS, and the broker is actu broker's actually functionality will be available through this particular port the MQTT port. Okay. Okay. So uh, let me first walk you through the IoT server to explain certain functionalities. So let me just log out first. So this, okay. So, uh, this is the management console for this particular product. Right? Uh, if you were there yesterday, uh, I mentioned that all of these capabilities are as available as APIs, like Paul said in his keynote, 100% API driven. So you can actually get rid of this particular UI and write your own thing uh, to, to deliver your own experience. So for example, let me just show you this particular view, right? which is showing all the devices that have been connected to this particular server, at least registered with this particular server, uh, and, and its uh, connectivity status. You can actually have a different view of this one. I'm actually going to show you a different view uh, in, in a while. So this product has uh, several UI actions that you can do using the UI. So first of all, the, the first action would be device management. So under device management, you'd be able to see the list of devices that it has connected with. Right? And if you take each of these devices, uh, there'll be a detail page. So based on the type of the device, uh, you, you would like see uh, like various things. Say, for example, if the device is having the location enabled, you would see a view like See a view like this. 
you would see a view like this with the operator. Now, this is the view for a mobile device. Uh, so all the operations that the mobile device is having, like uh, why being able to like install applications, and the location. And alongside this location, the map, you can actually define geofences and define certain rules with that. So it all depends on the device type that you uh, have there. So in this particular case, I'm only having uh, this locker device type. And uh, my device is not capable of uh, sending the location. Because of that, it's a very simple uh, uh, UI that you get. And it also lists out certain operations that the device is capable of doing. So the next option is device type management. So in this case, uh, this is a way of introducing the type of devices into the server. So if you take the server at the vanilla level, it doesn't understand anything about a particular device type. So in this case, for example, when we wrote the server side for the, the lock, right? we, 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 we told that this has two capabilities, two features. Right? One is you can remotely set its lock code so that uh, you can remotely control what is the key, key combination to use. And then you can uh, remotely mention, remotely control regardless of whatever the key code, whether the lock should be opened or not. You see, you can remotely open the lock or uh, make it uh, inaccessible for anybody. So these are the two operations that we support. Right? And then the lock, or, sorry, I'll go to a new screen so that uh, I can show you certain things. So let me just uh, call this uh, uh, bike lock 2. So the, I'm just creating a new device type. right? And I would be telling uh, how the lock will be communicating. So in this case, on this particular server instance, I'm only having the MQTT transport enabled for the devices uh, to be uh, reached. And then uh, let me say, uh, uh, So this is a verb, uh, verbal description of what the operation is. Okay. Sorry. So I add a device type. Then uh, once I add a device type, I'm being asked what are the what is the event format or what are the attributes that particular that this particular device will be sending. So the first I was being asked uh, what is the transport through which the device can be reached. The second part is about events where I'm being asked what are the things that are, that the device will be sending. So in this case, this actually corresponds to what you what I show you guys here. See, now in the case of this particular lock, this is the string that the, that the lock will be sending to the server side. So uh, I just put a string. So once I do this, this device type also appears here so that I can register an instance of this particular device type. So I'm, I will not be using this device type, but rather this one. Okay. Now, yes, uh, for the device type, yes. Yes. Okay. So this is the message that the device will be sending. Okay. So basically, this is a, a string that we, a JSON string that we concatenate uh, by collecting various readings from the device. So at a later point, later point when I connect the device, you would see 
the same string being received at the device. Okay? And uh, so device will be continuously. So uh, if I go to this main method, setup method. Device will be continuously sending data uh, into the in, into the MQTT topic with that string. Okay. Uh, so uh, I was explaining this. So uh, probably you guys have more questions. Uh, let me just run this through once, and uh, then we'll uh, attend to the questions later on. Okay, so uh, the other things, other, other functionality that are available are like managing groups. So that, uh, for example, you can tell these are the devices, these are the locks that belongs to a particular building or a particular flow. So you can create a group like that. And you can also manage users that are logging into the server. And uh, two other sections that, are, that I will not explain at this point. Okay? So uh, first, let me uh, just walk you through uh, the scenario of uh, like having all of this connected so that you will understand uh, certain things better rather than me trying to explain. OK. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to enroll a new device instance. Okay. So for this one, by the way, like all these registering devices, uh, sorry, device types and everything can be done even though I, I, I showed the UI, can be done using an API call. So this is the API call that corresponds to defining an a device type. So uh, you don't have to use the UI, but rather you can do this in, in your own UI. Okay. Okay. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to select the locker as the device type and create a new instance. So I'm going to give this a name. I'm going to do, make this door 10. Okay. Door 10. Just going to use the same thing. Okay. And once I hit create device, okay, this downloaded a certain file. Okay. So if I open that file, This set certain parameters that I need to be replay that, that I should be replacing on, on the agent. Okay? So here, the type of the device and the device's ID, unique identification from the system, right? and these two, the client ID and the client secret, will not change. So, for example, if you uh, take a look at This one, you would see, if you, if you compare the last, uh, last letters, it's the same client and the client secret, but the things that change are the device ID, because this is a new instance that I'm trying to connect to. Right? Device ID is different. And the access token and the refresh tokens are going to be different. Okay? So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to just replace these values in here. And the access token. And the refresh token, in the case of the token, gets expired. I believe my IP hasn't changed. One nine two one six eight forty three double eight. Yeah. Okay. One nine two one six eight forty three. Yes. So uh, I don't have to change anything else. Okay. So I have changed the device instance ID. The the and the access token and the refresh token. Okay. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to move this particular agent into the device. So for, for me to do this, this device is powered by a USB cable. 
I'm going to plug that device into my laptop. So this actually act, act as the power source as well. I hope this won't fall. So it got powered up. Right? So what I'm going to do is, uh, this has uh, two options. This, this uh, tick stands for compile, and this stands for uh, up uploading. Right? So uh, I'm going to first compile this. I think I didn't save this. Okay. Compile. So it is, uh, this particular script is called sketch in, in Arduino's world. So it is creating, uh, it's compiling. Going to take a while. So while that is okay, it's done compiling. While that is happening, uh, uh, so basically, uh, when I connected into this particular USB, uh, I had selected uh, this particular. Uh, it's called port in Arduino's terminology. I've selected the correct port to which I have connected this one, and uh, on the board, I have selected. Uh, Node MCU 10 uh, as the module. Okay, so I have now uh, done that, and now I'm uploading it. So uploading is a bit of a process. So you would see uh, this particular line blinking to show that uh, it is actually uploading. Yes. What we uh, what actually happens is when you introduce a device type, uh, that device type creates an API, right? And that API is then subscribed into an OAuth application. Right? That application has a client ID and a client secret, right? So regardless of the number of instances that connect, the client ID and the client secret remains the same. Uh, at least on this on this demo, right? But it's a risk. So let's say this this lock instance happened to be like uh, purchased by all of you guys. Now all of you guys are having the same consumer and, and the consumer key and the consumer secret within your devices. If one of you happened to decompile this code and get the consumer key and the consumer secret and do something malicious, that that is going to impact all the other uh, other other customers as well. So this is just a pattern. So anybody, so others may want to have separate subscriptions for each and every device instance. So that in that case, for each and every device instance, all these four needs to be changed. So uh, IoT platforms can uh, can define those as rules, but they are rather security practices of the device manufacturers and and the application developers. Okay, so this is now trans, uh, uh, transformed in the device. So uh, this editor has something called a serial monitor, which will show you the logs that are happening on the device. So uh, there's a small button here so that I can actually uh, restart the device. I'm going to do that so that you will see the initiation process of. Okay, so. Connected to the Wi-Fi, it got the IP. Okay? Now it is sending these values. Okay? So in this case, the current temperature uh, it detects as 20 uh, Celsius humidity. This one, metal is false. Occupancy is. How can there be an occupancy? It's. Uh, Detecting something. Yeah, let's uh, no, I, 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 I'm coming to that. So uh, open is true, and uh, we still didn't uh, try to uh, open the lock. So attempt is just uh, none, and the user. Okay. So let me just uh, have it here and press this switch. So in that case, opens happens to be false because I, I just pressed it and 
unpressed it. So if I keep on, so open happens to be false now. Okay? And let's say uh, I have a small metal piece here. So if I put it here, this metal detector, sorry guys, I, I was supposed to request a camera to be focused here, but I, I didn't do it in advance. So, so now the metal detector has detected there's a metal, which means now the value is true. Uh, so based on the alignment of my sensors, uh, like uh, this guy actually sometimes doesn't detect that uh, even though the metal is here, that the, it is occupant. So in that case, we'll try to use a different uh, bigger object. I brought this, so. Okay, now this is the device side. Okay. So this is what the device is sending into the server. Okay. So let me show you guys the server side. Okay. So what happens here is, these values are being communicated into MQTT, uh, sorry, uh, to a HTTP endpoint on the server, right? And those are available, if I go to the analytics server, In the analytics server, uh, there are a couple of things that I'll explain later on, but uh, there's something called data explorer through which you can, you can uh, see the data that it receives. Okay. So in the, this case, the data is being pumped into a particular table called IoT per device stream, uh, the tenant name and the device type. Right? So if I select this one, I would be selected with the data that that I'll be that I'm receiving. Right? So this data belonging to uh, November first. Right? So let me just uh, limit this for today, and the time I'll set it as uh, eleven right? up until uh, let's say tomorrow. Okay? So if I do this, I will see that uh, so I just connected this somewhere around 11.53. So if I have received these events, which means uh, the, the temperature value, the status of the metal, the occupancy, all these things. So right now there are close to how many records? Uh, four, eight, 11, right? So let me just try to uh, uh, do this, do that. And uh, I'll put a weight uh, on top of it so that the door remains closed. Okay. Now, uh, after a while, I think this is the latest, life's uh, 11.59, yes. So uh, the metal is false, occupancy is, there's something wrong with the sensor. Uh, open is false, right? And this is the device ID. Okay, any questions up to the, this point? Okay. All right. So let me show you a different perspective of the same thing that I've done so far. Okay? Now, all this time I have been using WSO2 products, WSO2 products interfaces to do this. Okay? So, for this demo, we have developed a UI as well, so that this will be the consumer interface, consumer interface for this lock. Okay? So, it's now I have purchased the lock, I'm logging in, right? to see the locks that I have purchased. Okay. So in this case, I have used the same device using multiple device names. That's why I'm seeing uh, these statuses. Right. So this is the current device instance. Okay. So let me just create a new instance. 
OK, so if I create a new instance, I have to go through the process of uploading the tokens again, uh, which I will not do, but I, I will do this uh, 211 and show you. So once I do this, it actually generates me the same, uh, same JSON file that is now having a different key combination that I need to upload. So uh, now, typically now, in this particular case, uh, we, we, we can't upload, upload the token into the, into the device in an easier way. That's why I'm using a manual way of uh, going to the edit and uploading. But uh, say, for example, if you take an Android device, they have something called uh, over the air updates, so that you can actually send these tokens automatically, rather than having a manual process involved. So it, it all depends on the capabilities of the device, how you can upload uh, uh, certain tokens that you require to have on the device. So uh, right. now if I refresh, right, so the new device will also be here. Right? Now this is the consumer application. So if I go to the IoT server, I should be able to see the same thing because it's just the same API on top of two on top of which two different uh, UIs are done. So this is the IoT service version. This is uh, the, the consumer's version. Right? So I will not be using this one, right? but rather I'll be using the previous one that I have uh, this thing. Right? So I'm going to remove this one so that the door should be open. Right? So I need to refresh this. And then always do, do is open. Okay? And if I want to see the statistics okay, of this one, so this shows certain things like whether the door is open. This is rather annoying me, so let me just. Uh, This will uh, make a certain anomaly detection pattern uh, go incorrect. That's why I want to fix this. Uh, anyway. uh, so if I now, for example, if I make this closed again, this should get updated. So uh, this is, and, and then uh, it's not metal. So if I put a metal here, It's a metal presence. Okay. This is a web socket that, that we are exposing. Uh, we first of all receive the device from the, the data from the device into the analytic server. From the analytic server, there's a web socket that we create, which I'm going to show. And that web socket is connected to this particular page. That's how all these refreshes are happening. And uh, this is showing a couple of more things just to show that uh, what are the different capabilities that you can do. Uh, so like telling open close status of the lock. So it tells like uh, uh, during this particular period, the one for open, the lock has been open. Rest of the time it has been closed. And the temperature variations. Right? So right now it's somewhere close to uh, 20. Right? The humidity variation, the occupancy, and the presence of metal. Right? So various different things. So, uh, any questions up to so far? So, what I've showed so far, yes. Okay. Yes. So, how that is identified is this, it's not only the credentials, there's a device instance ID as well. So for example, 
If I have, I'll, I'll show that. Right? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So uh, uh, I'll uh, finish what I just started. So this particular token is is associated with this particular device ID. Okay. So even if I change this to device 11, which is a valid device instance ID, it is supposed to fail. Okay. Uh, now. Uh, okay, uh, to summarize what we have seen so far, right, we have this device that is pushing data, right, that is being received by the IoT server, then pushed into the analytics, right, and on top of those analytics, uh, there's a WebSocket that we have opened up, so that, by the way, that WebSocket is also uh, protected, uh, so that uh, we can receive data for the devices that have connected under the user, admin in this case. Okay. So what I'm going to show is more analytics capabilities that are available okay, and how those have been done. So let me just open up this particular project. So uh, this is the web application, uh, which pretty much has, uh, say, for example, uh, devices being listed. Okay. So this is how we have. Uh, Basically, uh, the, this is the point that we generate the token and get details of the device and construct certain uh, uh, UI elements. Okay, so I was going to show you the analytics scripts. Okay. So, in these analytics scripts, there are uh, Several things. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show into the go into the analytics server and show a visual representation of how these different scripts connect. Right? So by the way, this is uh, the uh, the real time and the and the batch analytics capabilities that we have been discussed on various other sessions. Okay? So uh, okay. So this particular server happened to have uh, many. Uh, many such scripts, but what we need to focus is only this particular section. This one, all the way going up to here, spawning up to four, and these three. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, focus it there. Okay. So first, the device, sorry, the data is being received by this MQTT receiver the device type, the tenant's name, and the MQTT receiver. Okay? So for example, uh, when I created that, sorry, byte lock, it, it again created, in that case, I happened to create a HTTP, select HTTP, so it happened to create a HTTP receiver. So in this case, it's a MQTT receiver. Okay? So once you receive the data from the MQTT, okay, that received data is falling under this particular event stream. Okay. So there's a small color code that you have to follow. The blue color stands for event receivers, and the orange stands for event streams, the stream definition, which tells what is inside, the, 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 the structure inside. And uh, this magenta. Uh, magenta stands for the execution plan for the data that, that is coming in. And then the green stands for event publishers. Once the execution plan, plan gets executed, what to do with the data? Okay. So first we receive the data through the event receiver, which is happened to be MQTT. Then that data falls under this particular event stream. So for example, if the event stream definition does not match the incoming data, it will fail from this particular point onwards. Once you receive that particular event stream data, 
there's an execution plan which we call locker anomaly detection execution plan. I'm going to show the source code for this one later on. Right? And within this one, there are four actions that we perform. Actually, rather, three actions, right? One is we are generating general statistics about the locker usage. Then we are generating certain alerts. That will help me to generate an alert. Uh, certain alerts and pushing that into an event publisher called alert publisher. Right? And then we are uh, having another detection to understand various attempts to open the lock. And then uh, various operations that we send into the lock is also published into another event publisher. Right? So this is the overall flow of the execution. Right? Now, this flow, in order for us to create this flow, there are various configuration files that we have to upload. Right? Now, when I say various configuration files, you don't have to be, uh, you don't have to get uh, a bit annoyed. It is actually constructed as we call we call it a carbon application. So there's a uh, now there's a particular POM file through which you can create an application so that all of these things fall under a single folder structure so that you can meaningfully ma in a meaningful manage meaningful way manage that. Right? So let me just uh, walk you through the. Sorry, uh, this bit. Okay. Uh, uh, walk you through certain configurations files that help us to create this particular flow. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay. So, sorry, uh, could you repeat? I... Yes, exactly. Once you upload a uh, upload a certain analytic scripts that it will match each and everything together, and uh, it will create. Uh, actually, uh, there's a small part that gets created. So if you, can, if you take a look at this one, so if you can remember, when I created that byte clock, I didn't upload any analytic scripts. So what it did was, I, I said the byte clock is sent, uh, going to send some HTTP events. So it created a HTTP receiver, right? And then for that particular byte clock, based on the attributes that I have entered, it created an event stream, and it created an empty WebSocket publisher. This doesn't do anything because I haven't configured it. But in this case, in our locks example, this does something because we have written certain scripts. So before I show you certain scripts, let me show uh, something generated out of this particular flow, locker alert. Right? So how I can see that is, if I go back to the same data explorer, okay, there's something called uh, locker alert. How I figured out this name, you'll understand later. You'll understand later. Uh, Okay, so I'm going to just pick up the current date and maybe, uh, so I happened to remove this uh, maybe like five minutes ago. So it's 12, uh, 15, let's just select eight, right? And tomorrow, right? So there are two alerts for this time range. It says, can you guys see it? Can you guys see this? Locker is open for more than two minutes. And there have been two such alerts between 12.12 12 and 12.13. 12 okay. Pretty soon there'll be another one because uh, uh, we have just passed the, uh, yeah, it will come. So let me show how this was done. It should be here, yes. The third one came just now. So it's 12.15. Okay, so all right. So 
there aren't any scripts for these two files, right? So if I show you this one, MQTT event receiver, it's just a configuration like this, right? Which tells this is the event receiver name, right? And the input uh, input event adapter type is OAuth MQTT. This is what I mentioned that uh, the, uh, when I when I said the MQTT is being augmented using OAuth. And the event stream to which this data is received is IoT per device stream carbon super locker 100. So there's a version associated. Okay. So if I go to the stream section, okay, the stream name I should be looking at it, IoT per device stream carbon super locker. So there are quite a number of uh, streams. So let me just uh, search for locker. Yes, I believe, the, yes, uh, device stream, yes. So if I open this up, if I go to the source view, right, this tells me the, the expected format of this particular event. So it says the payload should have temperature, which is of type float, humidity, metal, occupancy, open, close status, and the attempt. Then, let me go to the flow again. That event is now being passed into this particular anomaly, uh, anomaly locker anomaly detection execution plan. Right? So I can open it up from here. Oops, yes, uh, okay. I'll open it up from the editor. Right? So in the editor, this is where the anomaly detection plan is. So it's uh, I believe I need to increase the font again. Yeah. So this is uh, quite lengthy because it deals with a lot of things. So let me just try to uh, extract the relevant part so that I can uh, explain. Uh, Okay, so this is the part. So see, this is the message. Locker is open for more than two minutes. Okay? So let me just uh, walk you up from here. Okay? So what happens here is, we are checking whether like uh, from the incoming data, so there's a time window that we capture. And the condition that we are checking here is uh, okay, it's easier to explain this uh, from the top. Okay. So uh, this execution plan imports certain things. So it imports, it takes in this particular event stream. Right? Then it is exporting several things. One is statistics about the locker, right? which is of the format, this particular format. Right? Then 
different attempts to open uh, open the lock is also being exported so that the event that being that is being exported is of this created format okay? and then various operations that uh, that happens on the locker is also being exported so the format is defined here then various alerts of uh, are also being exported so, and the event stream for that export is here and this is the format okay? then we are defining various streams so that we can deal with uh, various processing so uh, there's a last minute attempt stream there's a deny attempt stream say for example somebody tries to open the lock and it got denied and uh, allow open so in this case, uh, like I can set that regardless of whatever the, whatever the action, don't allow the lock to be open. And there are uh, anomaly patterns, say for example, there's something inside the locker, but the door is open for two, more than two minutes. And everything, the, all the data that we have. Right? Then data in is this one. So basically this particular incoming event stream is defined as data in. So we are doing from data in, right? we are selecting all the values that we receive right, into this particular stream. And then there's another condition. So basically here when you are selecting, now in this case, we are just selecting without a condition. In this case, we are selecting with a condition that tells the status is none that is the attempt status is none or else we are uh, selecting from here sorry when the status is success we are putting that into the alert stream telling the lock has been unlocked by the user how we figure out the user is based on the incoming event stream okay. when somebody has been denied lock this against see attempt status none no status have been made if i happen to enter a wrong key okay so now there's a i entered the key 3659 this a denial that happened and here we are checking for that denied okay same thing for block same thing for expire. Now all of these go into the alert stream. So all these actions get triggered as alerts. Okay. Then we are also doing another, uh, another execution, another uh, level of filtering. Okay. Basically, we are partitioning all the data that are coming from the data in, in stream in, by the device ID. So for each and every device ID, within a time end of 60 milliseconds, sorry, six, uh, one minute, right? Uh, we are selecting all the events that have happened within the last one minute into last minute attempt event stream. Then uh, for, from every last minute attempt event stream, right? if, the, if the status, is, so basically here we are trying to calculate uh, last three attempts that got denied. So that there's, there'll be a separate, a separate alert that tells there have been three attempts to open the lock. Okay? Just imagine using the same, uh, what happens when you try to enter a password on a, this thing and that tells us somebody has been trying to log into the system for three attempts and it failed. This is a similar scenario. And then uh, once this particular condition happens, there's an entry that goes into the deny attempt, right? And then there's a logic that allows you to block the device for one minute, right? So basically, here we are inserting all those events that matches that particular criteria into this particular event stream, deny attempt. And from deny attempt, right, we are state setting the allow open attribute of the device right, as false, is enable false, so that for a period of one minute, that logic is written in the uh, agent, period of one minute, the lock remains 
uh, inaccessible. Uh, similarly, if I go a little bit further, so these are the temperature variations. So uh, these are anomaly patterns. So basically, here we are uh, detecting uh, from anomaly window, which is defined here. Uh, we are def we are joining uh, certain conditions from all data, right? and from the event count, uh, we are detecting whether there have been errors that have happened. And, and then generating this particular warning. So uh, this is pretty much equivalent to uh, a particular scenario that is, uh, that is uh, related to this log. But uh, the general idea here is, you, based on the incoming stream, you can pretty much define a condition that matches a particular scenario. So uh, this, uh, this, this rather gets complicated if you want to deal with a lot of events. So in this case, we are detecting several attempts, several uh, scenarios. But uh, the power is now, the, the, this actually the Siddhi query. So uh, Siddhi query to, which allows you to process the event streams. So uh, you can write your own execution plans and, and uh, get various real-time events uh, process. Now in this case, we happen to have all of these execution plans in a single, let me show this again, single anomaly, uh, single execution plan. But you can actually split it and make it more readable by having it in multiple execution plans. So uh, the other, other elements are, OK, uh, let me uh, just walk you through a couple of other things quickly. So these actually, these XMS define the structure. Uh, for, for example, these called attempts to all the attempts will be stored in this particular structure. Same thing, attempt stream, uh, operation publisher. So in this case, uh, this is something important. So uh, uh, when we detect that there have been three occurrences of uh, uh, incorrect attempts, right? uh, there's a command that we send, an output publisher that we send into the device telling, lock the device. Lock the device for a certain period. Right? Now, this is being done by an lock operation publisher, right? So this lock operation publisher, see, when publisher's name is lock operation publisher, and here we are constructing the JSON to be sent to the device uh, so that it has the correct message to be processed at the device. And if you want to summarize some data, uh, this has an example of how to write that summary in a Spark script. OK, so uh, we're actually having uh, like six minutes left. So if you guys have any questions or any particular areas that you want me to show, uh, OK. Uh, I actually didn't show the most important part, uh, opening the lock. So I will uh, go to this one, right, and try to generate a key, right? So unfortunately, there's a small problem here. Uh, okay, no, two two eight six. Yes, this this line doesn't work. So this happens to be uh, two two eight six, uh, the code. So I can enter two two eight six. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show the device side as well. So what will happen is when I open the lock. You will hear a small click from these relays, but this guy will not go because this relay is not powered. Right? And you will see a message here as well, somewhere here. Oops. Two, two, six. This, uh, I'm not sure if you guys heard, there's a small relay click. And it, uh, it's, 
So if I try to enter this again, it will not allow me to do that. I will do this without talking so that you can hear the relay. The relay will open for three seconds. Two, two, six. It tells the attempt is expired. Okay. So if I try to generate another token, okay, seven will not work, so I have to generate it again. Zero six six five. It's a small click and unclick. You guys can actually come here and uh, observe it yourself later. Okay, so uh, if I now go into the web application, you should be able to see for the statistics. The lock is open, but uh, the lock has been, so it's going to take some time for it to connect to the WebSocket. Okay, while this loads up, any questions? Anything that I was not clear on? It's a bit of a lengthier demo. Yes. Uh, in the case of HTTP, now, uh, uh, now, if you are to call a device using the HTTP, it's a bit tricky because you need to have something listening on the device, right? But so in this case, uh, what we have done is there's a broker in between the device and the server, so that the server is pushing messages into MQTT, and the device is subscribed into the MQTT topic. Okay? Uh, now, in the case of device, device is actually pushing the data into HTTP endpoint on the server, right? So there's a listener already running on the server. Uh, so CoAP is pretty much uh, uh, similar to what you what you said, in the in the case of CoAP, there will be HTTP interface on the device or the gateway, so that you can actually reach the device and get the information pulled out. So, uh, Uh, could you could you repeat the question? I, the okay. The the idea is uh, microcontrollers are unable to use SSL. Yes. So effectively, the security is completely open. Yes. We have no 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 effective security. Yeah. So have you have you plan to address it? I have a few ideas, but if you have some plan for that. Um. Okay. So. Uh, one thing is uh, not to worry about it because the way the devices are being advanced, I believe like, uh, so DSL is one approach where like DSL has a, a, a TCP level way of uh, uh, replicating the SSL type of behavior. Uh, and the other approach is not to worry about what I mean by that is like uh, the devices eventually will have the processing capability to deal with HTTPS. Yeah, but That's, currently they don't, so. They, they, currently they don't. So. Uh, uh, of course, like in this case, HTTPS can be done. So uh, it all depends on maybe like limiting the limiting the proximity of the devices. Say, for example, like uh, you can come to our architecture like uh, okay, uh, architecture where when you pick the devices, right, you can actually come to an architecture where. Uh, the gateway to which the devices gets connected right, is actually capable of uh, encryption, whereas all these edge nodes are like uh, limited in their communication, so within a close proximity. Sure, so sure. Just people need to be aware of that. So, yeah. Yeah, so. so it, it all depends on uh, uh, how, you, how you kind of like pick. Uh, trying to like walk uh, work around the, the the limitations so that uh, it's, uh, I believe like those are the uh, those are the options that you have other than 
uh, like just exposing, say, for example, like uh, uh, there could be a small Wi-Fi capable chip that, that can correctly di directly connect into a, a cloud service. But if that chipset is not capable of encryption, you're just exp like putting a risk there. Right? Yeah. So rather than in that case, just have a communication gateway right? uh, to which that it can connect right? so that uh, like you are kind of restricting uh, the, the scope. So it's kind of a... Any other? Uh, if you guys want to like see this close up, just uh, feel free to come here. Okay, I believe we are done. Thanks, guys.